For 15 years during the Cold War, Britain's status as a global power was embodied by her strategic nuclear bombers, the V-Force. On constant alert, ready to be airborne and on their way eastward in less than four minutes, aircrew trained for just one task, deliver the ultimate weapon of destruction. between the two superpowers during the Cold War threatened the human race with extinction by massive nuclear exchange. During this period, a small but independent nuclear deterrent was also established by two European powers, the United Kingdom and France. Britain's strategic nuclear bombers, the V-Force, provided her nuclear deterrent until 1969. It sat alert for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, with aircraft ready to launch at a moment's notice. France too had a nuclear bomber, the supersonic Mirage 4. This carried out a mission known as pre-strategic nuclear strike. The Mirage 4 has only very recently relinquished its role in favor of a more modern successor, the Mirage 2000 m The detonation of the first atomic weapons in anger over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945 brought about the end of World War II. The bombs stunned the world with their awesome power and heralded a new age in global relations. Only America possessed the A-bomb, but the Soviet Union was catching up quickly. British scientists had been fully involved in the Manhattan Project, the development of the American atomic weapon. But immediately after the war, President Truman, unaware of this fact, embargo the passing of nuclear weapons technology to London. After World War II, Britain and France still possessed some measure of influence in global affairs through their far-flung colonies around the world. But this influence was waning and had been taken over by the United States and the Soviet Union, which was aggressively expanding its influence in the name of worldwide communist revolution. In order to secure a continued place at the world's top table, Britain and later France embarked on the development of an independent nuclear deterrent, along with bombers capable of delivering such weapons. In 1947, the RAF chiefs of staff declared their belief that the possession of weapons of mass destruction would be the most effective deterrent to war itself. Exhausted by war, its economy seriously weakened, and with social issues a national priority, 
Britain nevertheless embarked upon a massive atomic arms development program. This produced not one, but three jet bombers known as the V-bombs on account of their names, Valiant, Victor and Vulcan. The Royal Air Force's post-war heavy bomber force relied on the Avro Lincoln, a refined and re-engineered derivative of the Lancaster. The Lincoln was hardly suitable as a means for delivering atomic weapons. The V-bomber requirement was demanding. It called for a four-engine jet bomber with a range of 8,000 kilometers capable of delivering a four and a half ton atomic device while flying at 500 knots at 1,500 meters altitude. It had to be developed in just two years for service in 1953. In the meantime, RAF Bomber Command operated B-29 Super Fortresses on loan from the US Air Force. Known as Washingtons, they were intended as a stopgap measure but gave much useful experience in operating a relatively modern aircraft. Only at this stage did a clear target emerge. By 1947, Stalin's plans for worldwide communist expansion had turned British attention east towards the Soviet Union. The V-bomber requirement posed huge technical risks. As an insurance, an interim requirement was issued, calling for a bomber with reduced speed and ceiling. Short Sperry was the winner. Only two prototypes were built, and they gave valuable service as test aircraft in support of the V-bomber program. For the more demanding specification, the RAF received six proposals, which were eventually reduced to three. The first of these was the Valiant, which pioneered many of the weapons of and tactics for the v -Bomber. The prototype first flew in May 1951 after further testing and development. The production Valiant bomber was released for service in the Royal Air Force in 1955 and the age of the V-bomber had dawned. Possession of both bomb and aeroplane did not necessarily equal a nuclear capability. The early Valiants, flown by picked crews, spent much of their time in training and practicing operating procedures. In April 1952, Britain exploded her first nuclear device aboard a redundant warship of Western Australia. This formed the core of Blue Danube, the first air-dropped atomic bomb. Dummy bomb shapes had been dropped, but the actual weapon was not tested until October 1956, when a Valiant of No. 49 Squadron released a Blue Danube over Maralinga in southern Australia. Attention immediately turned to the greater power of the hydrogen bomb, for which a development program had already been instituted. In May 1957, it was again a valiant of No. 49 Squadron, which dropped an H-bomb on Christmas Island in the Pacific. The release simultaneously proved the effectiveness of the high-altitude turn manoeuvre specially devised to ensure that the aircraft was 10 miles away at the moment of detonation. Britain now possessed an operational strategic nuclear strike capability able to hit targets 2,500 kilometres away. In all, the RAF received 104 production valiants, 
the last being delivered in September 1957. These served as dual role or triple role bombers, tankers and reconnaissance aircraft. Tanker capability was the most useful way of extending the V-bomber's range, and it was again the Valiant which undertook the lion's share of development work. One more first was claimed by the Valiant. Four squadrons deployed in Malta in October 1956 to support Musketeer, the Anglo-French operation in Suez. The Valiant played a relatively minor role, dropping conventional bombs from medium altitude on Egyptian airfields. For its bomber design, Avro proposed a delta wing, a type of layout which had hitherto not been used on such a large aircraft anywhere in the world. Before committing to development of the bombers, Avro built five one-third scale research aircraft for low and high-speed testing of the Delta Wing configuration. In spite of the loss of the first aircraft, they validated the Delta Wing concept and provided much useful information for the Vulcan project. The Vulcan was the first of the new bombers to fly. The aircraft made an impressive sight as the Type 698 prototype was rolled out for its maiden flight in August of 1952. Its massive, almost perfect delta wing gave it the ability to cruise comfortably at high altitudes. It was as fast as a contemporary fighter, while at the same time pilots praised its docile handling quality. Displays at the Farnborough Air Show that year quickly followed, which demonstrated the Vulcan's fighter-like handling. In spite of its size, it could even be rolled easily. Flown with a stick, production Vulcans easily outmaneuver fighters practicing intercepts against them at high altitude. Completing the trio of V bombers, the Victor became the last to fly on Christmas Eve 1952. Like Avro, Handley Page also adopted an advanced wing design to meet the challenge of cruising at high subsonic speeds and at high altitudes. The most noticeable characteristic of the Victor was its crescent-shaped wing and high-set T-tail. Like the Avro 707, a similar research aircraft, the HP-88 was built to test this type of wing layout. This feature of reducing the wing's sweep angle ensures a constant Mach number along the entire length of the wing and generates very little transonic drag. With a top speed of 960 km an hour at high altitude, the Victor was the fastest of all the V-bombers. Indeed, a clean Victor could break the speed of sound in a shallow dive. The Victor also handled well, although it lacked the Vulcan's fighter-like agility. More importantly, the Victor could fly higher, faster and farther, and could carry a larger conventional bomb load. The Vulcan and Victor had their own strengths and weaknesses, yet they were so closely matched in performance that the RAF decided in June 1952 to order 25 of each for squadron-level assessment. But in that event, the RAF could never bring itself to choose between the pair, and they continued to be ordered in parallel 
until late in their production careers. The production Vulcan B Mark I was flown in 1955, followed the next year by the Victor. The Vulcan B Mark I introduced more powerful Olympus turbojets, as well as a new King Delta Wing, which gave better handling and safety at high speeds. Deliveries began to number 230 operational conversion unit at Waddington in August of 1956. The following July, number 83 squadron formed as the first operational unit. Victors were delivered to the OCU at Gaydon in late 1957. Number 10 squadron in Cottesmore became operational in April of 1958. Due to its strategic nuclear role, the V-Force was an elite one. Getting into a V-Bomber was no easy task. The crews were the best and most experienced in the RAF. All captains had to have 1,750 flying hours in command. The Vulcan force was rapidly established, so that by the end of 1958, there were squadrons at Waddington, Finningley and Scampton. By September of 1960, Development in the Victor Mark I was complete, with two squadrons each at Cottesmore and Honington. Unlike SAC bombers, which had some measure of defensive armament, the V bombers flew entirely unarmed. The strategy changed from 1960 on, when all aircraft began to be modified with a comprehensive suite of electronic countermeasures, warning and jamming equipment. By mid-1958, the UK deterrent had reached a credible level with the issuing of the first hydrogen bomb, Yellow Sun. Credibility hinged in no small measure on the ability of the V-bombers to evade not only the Soviet air defence arm, but also a preemptive strike on their bases. At the hub of the deterrent force was a group of 10 Class A airfields, which acted as the main basis for the V-bomber squadrons. Each was protected by Bloodhound surface-to-air missiles. In addition, at least 26 further UK airfields were designated as dispersal bases, ranging from fighter command stations to civil airports. More bombers could have operated from Britain's Mediterranean bases and in the Near East, further complicating the task of the defence. The main bases were spread throughout the Midlands and East Anglia. The V-bombers were assigned numbers one and three groups of bomb command, with number three group of valiants and victors occupying the southern area. During this period, V-force bombers frequently practiced long-range deployments to overseas locations. Usually conducted singly, these were known as Lone Ranger. They went eastward to West Germany, Cyprus, Saudi Arabia, and south to Kenya and Rhodesia. The Western Rangers headed across the Atlantic, stopping at Goose Bay in Canada, before continuing to SAC headquarters at Offord in Nebraska. A close relationship and joint nuclear strategy developed between the V-Force and SAC, which incorporated the RAF bombers into its nuclear strike plan in 1958.